Hey everyone, Brendan Snyder here. Thanks so much for joining me. Got a special guest joining in today. I've got Tommy Paris, former frontman for Britney Fox and current keyboardist with Count 77. How are you doing, man? Good. How are you doing, Brendan? I'm great, man. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, so you were just uh, warming up. You were, said you were doing sound check. How did that go? Good. It was it was a good was fast today. Oh um, yeah, that's, that's good. The, sa the sound crew is awesome. So when they when they're awesome, it, it just goes faster. So that was nice. Uh, most of the time, it goes pretty good. Every now and again, it drags on. So I didn't know exactly when I would get back to you. Yeah. So. Oh no, this was perfect. This was a great uh, little tie in here uh, to it. I've got uh, uh, no problem with it. That was awesome. So I want to jump back a little bit in your history. Um, before you were in Britney Fox, and that's how most people came to know who you are, uh, taking over as front man in that band, you had a band called Jilson. And, and first of all, am I pronouncing that right? Yep. Okay. So, and, and in that band, you went under the name Don Jilson. Is that your real name? or is That, that was my real name, yeah. Okay. So why did that not continue with you? Why did you not take that, or why did you change it to Tommy Paris when joining Britney Fox? Well, when I joined, I wanted to keep it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I was. It's like, hey, I got, I got a break here, and then people will know. You know, I got in this group; it'll be fun. You know, but the like management and people were like, you know, you have music out under that name. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Anyway, so anyway, I, I changed so they it. <laughs> yeah, they didn't. They didn't want it related to the previous recordings that you had already done. They wanted sort of like a clean break. Exactly. Okay. I always wondered about that. I I was never quite sure whether Don Gilson was the the stage name and Tommy Paris was the real name or vice versa. So there, yeah, there's surprisingly not a lot of info on you out there on the internet. I had to like really scour some stuff to uh, to try to put all this together. But um, you're here, so you're getting you're able to answer all of that. I appreciate it. Um, so how did you come to uh, the attention of the guys in Britney Fox to take over? As lead vocalist i had a friend uh she was a singer in a in a band around town this was in vegas when i was there and one day she handed me this trade magazine and for people who don't know who, don't, who aren't old enough to know they were like an oversized sort of like an almanac or a map book right. of industry ads and things for mostly went out to like industry people so anyway i'm not sure how she came came about it but she had it and she gave it to me she said hey these guys are looking for a new singer why don't you check it out and i said okay and i just kind of set it aside I, I didn't really look at it and then a few days later i was looking at it, reading it's like yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna check this out so yeah so i just i started sending them stuff right and, and, have, uh, and had you been fans of their stuff before or was it kind of a new thing uh that you were checking out just at that time I'm sorry. What would you say? It was it what? Had you had you been been fans or or a fan, I should say, of Britney Fox in advance of this, or was it more of just sort of uh, you discovered it at the time because they were looking for a singer? Yeah, I, I discovered it at the time because they're looking for a singer. Yeah, I was. We, I was kind of into some. You know, there was the whole. You know, if the, you just take the '80s, they had all the sub genres, but like this, there was rock, but then there was like the new wave. Right. And there was just the hair metal, whatever you call it, glam, right. et cetera, et cetera. And then there was kind of the metal metal, which is like um, what I was into at the time, like Dio and Judas Priest and Sabbath and mm -hmm. and the Scorpions and some of that. To right. me, it was more of a hard, harder rock stuff. Not They were all kind of doing hair. But anyway, I was kind of into that stuff a bit more at the time mm -hmm. and maybe a little more progressive stuff from uh, days gone by. So I, that, I went, they weren't really on my radar when I came across that. So that's that's interesting to hear. Uh, I mean, one, because I think your voice and your sound fit it so perfectly. Um, and that's what, you know, introduced you to me through that aspect of it. And so I certainly look for that in things that you're doing today. But you've got that now makes more sense in terms of other projects that you've got. I was listening to some of your solo stuff that you've got out there and we were communicating back and forth on that. And the the current solo album that you have out, which is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but Earth Hears? Earth Hears, yeah. Yeah. So when I first was listening to that and I'm getting sense of more like 
glam rock instead of glam metal out of it. So I'm getting more of that sense, sort of Beatlesque vibes out of it. But there was different changes and different styles of music within it that for me, I started to feel sort of a progressive vibe to some of it, even though it was on the pop side of things. And so that's that's I'm finding that interesting now because when listening to all your stuff, you know, you go back to the Britney Fox stuff and I love your Tommy Paris band project. Uh, that was what, 2017 or 2018? That's yeah. a little bit more in line. And then of course you've got the Count 77 stuff, but it's like you've got a, a wide variety of different projects and styles of music that you play within. Yeah, it's um, I've, I've liked music really from diverse categories for my whole life. Um, my parents and my older brothers turned me on to a bunch of stuff. And then I started discovering stuff on my own. So, yeah, my, my tastes are all over the place, you know. What was, uh, I don't know, the first, ma you know, major band or whatever that you got into as a kid? Um, through my family, probably probably the stuff my parents were listening to, a lot of the 50s rock and roll. Yeah. Um, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, oh, uh, that, that kind of stuff, you know. Um, I loved Little Richard. The way mm -hmm. he sang, you know, that was he was a big influence. But and then uh, my older brothers were turning me on to stuff like Led Zeppelin and Rush and right. uh, that kind of stuff. So Deep okay. Purple. Yeah. So all that stuff ended up kind of getting put into the blender in terms of what makes you who you are sort of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's weird. Like you, you can be inspired by something and then by the time you write it, and it comes out, it just doesn't really sound exactly like that. It's kind of your interpretation of whatever influenced that, you know, or whatever. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's all over the place. No, and it's, it's, it's fascinating how that can happen with stuff. Um, you can sit down, as you said, to try and write a song that sounds like Rush or sounds like Little Richard or, or whatever the artist is that you're doing. But your soul, your heart, your you know personality is going to come through it no matter what um but then exactly you know, that's what makes us fans of you or a band or someone like that is that that personality that's coming through in it uh to me is what makes that sort of stuff genuine otherwise it would just all be sort of tribute music out there i suppose yeah it's kind of funny because like on this i wrote earth ears during the right before the pandemic and then all through it right <clears throat> and uh, at the time, you know, I just wanted to wipe the slate clean and start from scratch and write something uh, without anything in mind. You know, to the Tommy Paris Band CD, yeah, was writ was written to sort of be a kind of a companion piece to Britney Fox, so that the band I had at the time we would play half Britney Fox and half that stuff. So it was kind of that would fit more. So it was kind of designed to be a little bit more metally, you know, I yeah, guess, yeah, hard rock metally. But does. this one I want. It, it, you, would you call it would you call that disc hard rock or or, or uh, metal -y? what would you call it so you're, yeah the tommy paris band well i'm going to use the yeah. term you probably don't like but glam metal uh, to me that's okay that's fine yeah it's britney fox and that's what i loved about it and i had found that you know that's actually when i first reached out to you probably about a year ago at this point where i was asking you whether there were any cd editions of that available and I was so bummed to find out that there weren't any more at that time. No one's selling it on eBay or anything out there. But it just, for me, clicked. It was a perfect fit. So I can see why you're calling it a companion piece to Britney Fox. It's exactly that. That's cool. Yeah, that, that was, you know, that was an, an intentional thing to set out. Though I, I really do like some of the tunes on there, how they turned out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a lot of cool stuff on there that I like. But um so yeah, all those CDs sold. In fact, uh, before we did that show last year at the Whiskey, I I had a like a a, a big package of stuff, mm -hmm. and the, my last CD of that was in it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, the best. I don't even have a CD of that anymore. So <laughs> I will reprint. I'm going to reprint those for sure one of these days. But right sure. now, it's kind of like it's kind of all on hold. But yeah, I would definitely like to reprint that. But um, I'm going to hold yeah, you. Probably, you'll you'll keep hearing from me every so often. Asking about it because <laughs> I, I do I, print that shit. Yeah, I, I know that at least uh, the viewers on my channel alone would really uh, dig getting a hold of some of that. Most of them, when I previously talked about having first found it uh, and then talked about it on the channel, they didn't even know that it existed. I was glad at least that it is streamable out there to be able to send people off to to check it out that way. 
Uh, yeah. You have your your current solo album up for streaming because it's only on YouTube right now. Yeah. 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 You can hear most of it's on there, not all of it. Yeah. Um, after my experience with the with the Tommy Paris Band streaming thing mm-hmm. going out to all the services, I kind of held back on this time for various reasons. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, this one's uh, this one's you can you can get the CD, but it's it's through my website. But uh, and and not on any of the streaming stuff right now. I'm kind of trying some different things. Um, so yeah. So anyway, um, is that just yeah. an issue with the fact that streaming doesn't really you know return any dividends to you on it, or is it just a bad experience in general with uh, the nature of you know those relationships and and legal stuff with them? Well, that's that's part of it. Yeah, uh, that's that's definitely part of it. Thing is, is um, I you know, there's I mean, you you know, a zillion. I know a zillion musicians, and they're all different as far as what they want to do, mm-hmm. as far as like playing live or just putting music out and not playing live. Whatever. So, I I I like playing live a ton. So, I don't. Uh, I have an avenue when this thing is rolling. Like I said, we've only done a few shows. We did one at the Whiskey last year and uh, with my solo band. But uh, I like uh, selling stuff in the venue, mm-hmm. and people are right there. Oh, sure. And you can, it's kind of your, it's kind of your temporary little store setup. Yeah. Uh, at each place, and it's kind of more, it's more intimate, and it's more like you know, I mean, the 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 structure of the industry, as you know, these days it doesn't exist. Right. So there's not even not even a network to be had. Mm-hmm. So, so anyway, but, uh, so yeah, uh, you can hear most of it on you, on my YouTube channel, but, um, the disc is for sale and there's MP3s for sale. They're just not in the form of on any of the streaming services, but you can actually down buy and download mm-hmm. the whole album off my website. So that's excellent. MP3s. Yeah, definitely yeah. Anyone tuning in right now on this should definitely head over to, Tommy Paris's website where you can check that stuff out and certainly more. There's like, you've got a lot of merch up there, uh, which is awesome. Uh, switching gears a little bit. So how did you come to the attention then of count 77? And for those that don't know, you're playing keyboards. You're not singing lead. I know that was a shock for me at least. So a little different Avenue for you. Yeah, I was, um, let's see, do you, you heard of, uh, shrapnel records? Yeah. Okay. Mike Varney owns that. And, uh, I've known Mike since probably 89 or so. Oh, wow. We talked over the years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he would, he got hooked up with producing that, their first record, Count 77. And I knew him. And then engineering that record was Sean O'Dwyer, who engineered on the Bite Down Heart album. So, cool. Yeah. So they're, they're making the record. They made it and they're right at the very end and uh, they want to do some keyboards on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not crazy tons of keyboard just kind of pad stuff you know uh no rick wakeman stuff (laughs) and uh so i I went in as a session they just because sean knew me and mike knew me Mm -hmm. i just went in and did it as a session and i played on the record and did the keyboards and that was it and then uh i didn't hear from a few weeks and then they came to me about a month later or so and asked if i wanted to be in the band and go out and do the live shows and i was like yeah yeah if i can take if i can take care of my family i'm in that's cool. Mm-hmm. That, that's a, that's sure. a great experience. I was just, you know, for, for me, an outsider, someone who doesn't, uh, you know, or as I said, you know, there's not a lot of information about you on the internet um, per se. So finding out that you were doing this is playing keyboards, not taking lead vocals on this. Um, I knew you played guitar. I didn't know you did keyboards. Then come to find out with the solo album and stuff, you're playing a lot of those instruments that are, that are on there. So you're, quite versatile in terms of uh, the instrumentation and uh, things that you can play. Yeah. And it's um, a lot of people, I, I sing, I sing backups on every song and it's, mm-hmm. if these guys weren't, if these guys weren't really cool and I enjoyed them, I, I, I probably, I probably wouldn't do it. Right. And I, I love lead singing mm-hmm. and I want to lead sing, but I, I guess, I, I guess I'm pickier <laughs> about what I'm going to lead sing when I'm going to sing for my for myself right mm-hmm. uh because I, I don't really have a a penchant for copying anyone deliberately anyway right it may it may turn out that way but i'm not i'm not setting out to do that and i'm not really uh 
I, if it's not something I really want to leave kind of for, you know, playing the instruments, there's a couple of steps, even if back, even singing back of both, it's a few steps of intimacy removed to a degree from lead singing. To me, right. the lead singing is like, it, it's a, it's almost a religious experience. It's, mm-hmm. it's really like, I really got to be into it mm-hmm. to do it. So I've been, I've been perfectly cool with just stepping back and play. Cause I play, drums and bass and guitar and keyboards and everything so i'm happy to take on a different role and be participating in the in music in general and playing live and traveling around uh without having to be the lead singer like i gotta be the lead singer right. there's none of that it's like when i do lead sing i love it I, I love it but i'm i guess i'm picky i guess i don't know yeah well no that makes sense i mean you know it's a different experience, obviously, as you're saying, when you're a front man for something, you're up there, the eyes are on you, you're performing in a particular way as the front person, the representation in some cases of what people think the band is. When you're in the, not so much the background, but you're behind that and you're performing an instrument and you're not the one that's on display, so to speak, that's a different thing. And you mentioned how much you love playing live. So getting out, getting to play live, And then you still can go out and do your thing where you can be picky in terms of how you're going to sing, what you're going to sing and so forth. And you put, you know, that takes a lot of energy, obviously. I can imagine if if you're getting up in front with your band, writing your songs, your lyrics and so forth and having to sing that, then getting up and just jamming and enjoying the music as a participant, as you said, I'm sure there's two different levels of intensity involved in that. Absolutely. So I'm like I said, so yeah, so I'm, she, I've played, I was in, I played just, it's just kind of funny. Some of the different things I played in, mm-hmm. I played drums in a country band called the country rebels with all cops. Oh, yeah. Except me. yeah. The <laughs> guitar player, Bobby Dante, he was a SWAT guy. And then yeah. you had beat, beat cops, Chuck Castle on guitar, the beat cop. Wow. <laughs> and, um, I won't I won't say which one, but I remember driving to rehearsals having Budweiser tall boys on the way with with <laughs> with the cop with the cop driving, you know. It was awesome. But um that was fun. And then I played in a I played in a punk band in Vegas with my good friend Donato Feoro. He was a singer. This guy's an awesome. He he writes and sings his stuff. I'll send you a link sometime, but yeah, he's yeah, just great. great. He's a songwriting machine, dude. And he's, uh, but I played in a band with him. I was a drummer in that band. He was a lead singer. We had another guitar player. And on bass was a guy named Chris Sprinkle, who is now Chris Kale from oh. uh, Five Finger Death Punch. Yeah. <laughs> and we, it was so off the wall. And we just had a gas. He was so funny. Mm-hmm. That band was so funny. But I had a, I had a blast playing that band, you know, as, as a drummer and backup singer. So yeah, you know, I've been I've been all over the place. Has, with, there, uh, has there been a, any? Um, is there an instrument you play that you've not played in a band? I mean, you said you played bass. Have you been a bassist in a band as well? Yes. Yeah. So you played <laughs> all different roles of it, and uh, and you would say you're you're happiest as front man. I I enjoy singing the most. Okay. I enjoy singing the most. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so yeah, so you know, I'm kind of schizophrenic when it comes to some of that stuff. Yeah. And um yeah, it's it's just interesting, you know, it's uh uh so much of life goes on in and around the music. Right. Um that like it's an it's an ins- plus the industry that changes. It's just an insane world to negotiate sometimes, uh, because it changes just changing so fast. Right. It has been and it continues to. So it's kind of like uh just trying to figure out. You know your footing sometimes things are just like wow it's really moving fast here oh, absolutely so. um so i think this was back during the pandemic when you put these two cds out of archival material demos that you had yep uh what what brought that about was that the label reaching out to you or was that sort of a hey this is the pandemic and i can't tour i should get some product out there or a little bit of both no uh steve from the label got a hold of me yeah I I did I'd known him for a while, and we talked about stuff. We kind of went back and forth on what it could be, and right. a lot of those demos were already out. They yeah. were actually already out there, but I I saw and 
right? Yeah, you, that, that was. I can't see the Sea Isle demos or whatever. Uh, it, well, this is the. Uh, I don't know. I, it's sort of like the. It was purchased off the Britney Fox website at the time, back around like 2003 era, when you guys first yeah. had your reunion. So it's sort of like it's not a bootleg, but I mean it's it's got photocopy quality, but it just says it's the bite down hard sessions. Yeah, that stuff. So there's so, a lot on there, but I will say for those tuning in, there's there's a lot on here that isn't on those. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot on there. I I went back and I got the original, found the original tapes in storage mm -hmm. and brought them out, et cetera, et cetera, blah blah yeah. blah. And then I added some stuff that it, it wasn't out, right? Um, that we had done demos, and then I had some stuff of my own that I put on there. Um, stuff I really like a song I wrote for my wife for a wedding called yeah. Tracy my, my wife's name's Tracy and there's a song called Tracy on there and I I, I wrote that for her for our uh, our uh, marriage at, uh and that was uh that was cool it's a cool song it's 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 stamped in time from the yeah. period it's from but and then uh I covered a a Slade song in on there uh called Little Sheila mm -hmm. which is from Rogue's Gallery album and I, I I really like that too. I, that's, I I really like how that one turned out. It's pretty cool. So there's some other stuff on there. There's a, a song that I that I like too from some like <laughs> obscure sort of released but not really released but unreleased but released right. but not really record called Screened. Okay. Um, and it's cool. It's kind of like psychedelic -y stuff. And uh, I think there's one other original on there. I can't remember what it is. Obviously, it made a big impact on me. If I can't even remember what it was, but. Um, <laughs> You know, so there, yeah, there's some good stuff on there. And like, to be honest with you, I, to be honest with you, like, and I, that's why I, I wrote, <laughs> Steve's probably like, I wrote this dissertation of like, mm -hmm. trying to explain why I don't want demos out. Right. <laughs> and um, so it, Steve humored me and let me do it. He put it in there, thankfully. But like, oh. I was trying to explain that, you know, when those sea aisles, when that sea aisle, stuff, we were using a little task cam four track brendan like it was a cassette and it goes one way and you get four tracks off it we were using that to write on mm -hmm. that's all it was for is writing i mean we wrote a ton of stuff for bite down hard mm -hmm. or demoed a bunch of stuff that we wrote and only a, a bit of it made it so i figured hey if you didn't make the record then it sucks enough where it, it shouldn't be heard <laughs> that's my opinion but then they <laughs> came out and they were all out there and i was like oh jesus it's like no one was supposed to ever hear this shit Right. So and that went on. I was like, you know, I was, I was pissed about that for a while. And then the guys are telling me, hey, dude, people who are into it, they don't care. They know it sounds like shit. They just want it. They just like it. So they want to they want to hear it. Where, all right. OK, cool. So anyway, when this came up, I was like, well, they've already heard all this stuff anyway. So let me see if I can expound on it and do something. So that's why that that's what I have. But yeah, it's there's some there's some cool stuff on there for well, people who want to dig in. Yeah, certainly from a fan standpoint, I'm I'm glad that at least you decided to put the demos out. And I get where you're coming from on it. They weren't finished. They weren't uh, properly done. You know, the album itself, you know, this is the the thing that captures it in time that you wanted as the, the memory, the moment for it. And I get that. But all that other stuff is so good. And for those of us, at least, that are such fans of this album here, the idea that we can get two more albums worth of stuff. I mean, you don't have any idea how excited I was when I, you know, found out that those things were being released and then got it. And sort of the, you know, the day that it made for me getting to hear those things. And I don't know, I mean, I think they're surprisingly well done for being four track recordings that were never 100% finished off in the day. They sound great. I love throwing the records on and hearing them. So Right on. No, that's, there you go, right there. Perfect. So, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, I, I have my take on everything and then other people have a different take and it's like, I can't, I can't discount mine or anyone else's. So right. yeah, that's, I'm glad you like them. Um, yeah, I, I try to explain to somebody with, with Steve, let, let me put that thing on there. Like if you say you're a painter uh -huh. and you had a, you had a room full of paintings that yeah. were like half done and they're in your studio, wherever that's at. Mm -hmm. And People come in, a bunch of people, bunch of people come in and are looking at them, mm -hmm. and you're like, you'd be abhorred. You're like, no, no, don't even look at them, man. It's like they're not even done, you know. And if if they didn't make your, what do they call those when they have a, a gallery? Uh, they have a 
a showing or whatever, and you put out your stuff that's supposed to be seen in there or whatever, and, all, and then all the shit that you don't care about is back at the studio, half finished or just looks like shit or whatever it is. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of what I was trying to say about the demos. Anyway, I finally got over it. I'm like, you know what? I I surrender. That's it. <laughs> They're out. They're being heard. Whatever. There it is. <laughs> get where you're coming from on that. Uh, in my uh, nine to five life, I'm an architect. So I do, you know, drawings, renderings, designs, and there's always that first pass design of anything you're doing. And sometimes that needs to be shown to a client before it's actually done. And they'll get hung up on the tiniest little detail that has never been worked out yet. And you're like, no, 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 don't look at that, right? So I totally get it. And I hear where you're coming from. I just wanted you to know from a fan perspective on it that we're not looking at it as um, where are, quote, mistakes or unfinished aspects of it. We're just looking at it as this is what could have been. This is another song. It could have been on the album. What would the album have sounded like had that song been on it? What if there had been a part two, right? That's at least how I listen to these things and look at it and say that, you know, if Britney Fox had continued and gotten to make one more album with Tommy Paris at that time, you know, would these other songs have turned up on it? So, yeah, definitely glad that you put it out. But I guess kind of on that note, why didn't uh, Britney Fox continue on? Was that because of what was going on in the industry? You know, the downfall with glam metal, the rise of grunge and that stuff. Or was there any internal issues with the band that just didn't allow it to continue on? Well, what we did, we did some stuff through the rest of the 90s. That was it, you know. Yeah. But then at the end, at the end of the 90s, around 2000, there was a TV show on yeah, that tie that's coming. Yeah, that's right after this, the the live album. Yeah, the, there's a TV show called Where Are They Now that was on VH1. I remember that. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. And we were on it. And when we were on it, it was just a short piece, right? What the band was doing. And then when we were on it, uh, Spitfire, the label Spitfire, right. was owned by Eagle Rock, mm -hmm. got a hold of us, say, hey, you know, because there was some interest of, in the band after. Because around up, up until about 2000, if you were from the eight, late eighties or eighties or into the early nineties and Everyone. had done what we were doing and others, you it was just absolutely like you know blaspheme to even be kind to you. Yeah. So, so by the time two thousand rolled around, it was kind of like that mood was lightening up and people were kind of like, oh yeah, they weren't they weren't that bad, you know, blah blah blah. So we we got some interest in the label and we were gonna the the original goal was to re-release. The first three uh, Britney Fox records and a new live record, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that was the, that was the and, and then, oh, then an option for a, a new studio record after. Right. That was the, that was what was supposed to happen. Well, something happened with the, the licensing. So the first three weren't going to come out. So we're just all right. Well, we'll just start with this live album out of nowhere. So we played some dates and uh, had a, had the had the. Uh, mobile stuff out and recorded them and then right. that's what that record is there that's that's the record the yeah long way to live and uh so then we had the we had another record to do uh for them and that was that's springhead motor shark yeah. which <laughs> which is another interesting piece of work there absolutely uh the opening track on it pain is an awesome song i absolutely love that one and would love to hear more like that stuff but for you guys to have done that and what was this like 2001 uh, uh, that was 2003 ish i believe 2003 ish ish uh, yeah i mean i don't know you guys picked up right where you left off i thought that was absolutely fantastic and you guys yeah it was, it was just it was a it just you know look at it if because it's kind of gone away but are you were you a guy into the sequencing of an album oh yeah in other words okay all right yeah. so even though i realize that's a that I do, that used to be a huge thing they would bring in guys to sequence your, your record right i mean it was it was a wow. and, and i was always yeah you know what i mean like uh when when uh well anyway blah 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 but like it was kind of it meant a lot to me what order you are going to hear everything in because it kind of had to tell somewhat of a story and i 
I know there's singles number 45s back then. So stuff did have to stand. It did have to stand on its own. Mm -hmm. But I always like the sequencing. So if you listen to Springhead with a good system or like really good headphones, mm -hmm. you got to listen to the whole thing all the way through. Earth Ears is the same. Right. It's 14 songs and it's meant to be heard in that order. When I when you when you get the Earth Ears, yep. if you can, oh, I will listen to spend it. Spend the time to do it in one shot. So and then and then I'll get your take on it after you after you do. If you can, it's a lot to ask for people these days. Oh my gosh, it's uh, attention span is is uh is gone. So anyway, so that's a big ask. So if you can, great. But I had a point. Oh, I had a point. Oh yeah, uh, Springhead. Yeah, Springhead is meant to be heard that way too. Springhead Motor Show. So you have you put it off from the beginning, right. go to the very end in one shot and as it takes you out it's kind of like uh it's that's how it's meant to be heard and i and there's some cool stuff in there for sure. Yeah. I I'll have to go back and listen to it in that regard, but I am one of those people that I'm an album person. I'm not a singles person. I, I can't start an album on track three. I got to start at yeah. the first track on it and go from there. I might not finish it based on a length of time that I have to listen to something. But for me, I start at the beginning for exactly what you said, the sequencing. And if you go back, you know, before CDs where things were vinyl as the primary or they were originally released, the sequencing was both sides. Right. So your first track and your last track on side A was something and your first track and last track on side B was something else entirely. Whereas when we get the CD and you put those together now, some of them don't flow the same way they did when they were two sides of an album. And I always love looking at stuff that's like that from back then versus not so much presently now, but like the, the 80s, the 90s, where they were sequencing for CD and we only had one first song, one last song on there. But what was the middle thing? And you brought it up in there that it's like telling a story. I always look at it as peaks and valleys in it. You know, you don't want the album to just be one monotonous thing that goes all the way through or start, you know, heavy or, or hard or whatever. And it falls off or vice versa. And you want it to do something to achieve something. And for every artist, that's going to be a different thing. But when I listen to albums, I enjoy hearing the variety, what I call the peaks and valleys in it, where if it's, you know, an up-paced song, when do we slow down? Does it slow down too soon? Does it stay up too long? You know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I'm going to have fun listening to your solo album, and I'll certainly give you some feedback for sure on it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. It's uh, So, yeah, the sequencing, I, I when I turn my sons on to – music uh, older stuff I, I i have them do that and they humor me sometimes and do it you know but yeah but like you said you know uh people younger people today don't generally approach things as an album they're they, the, everything is marketed these days as singles and there's a lot of artists out there that have given up on the album and only released singles which i really don't like uh, to me you can have your singles but you should give something out as a complete piece of art, so to speak. And that whole thing, and what is the single versus the deep cut, and as a, you know, the the flow within the album and all of that, but you just get one song. For me, it's very hard to digest only that three or four minute piece of something with no context around it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely like a preference, but not the only thing. And I, I get that. I'm just real, once again, real picky, but like I, you know, I'll put on an AM gold playlist off YouTube and uh, my wife likes that stuff a lot. Yeah. So and those, those are all just like the one hit people right. stuff. So, so, you know, singles have their place for stuff for sure. It's not the be all and end all the sequencing. I just prefer that if you, if you have a choice, yeah. you know, absolutely. So, and, and just uh, and starting to wrap things up, um, you had a, a short lived project and I don't think there was ever an album cover for it. But your Uncle Edna project, this is the way I yes. at least uh, ordered that yeah. one, uh, from your website uh, back in the day. Um, whatever came of that project and it did it, you only put out the five song EP or was there ever anything more to it? That was it. Oh, because I've always been wondering about that. That was, you know, kind of pre before the Internet got really, you know, the way it is today. This was that was late 90s, I think. 
uh, when I'm yeah. to find that. But you, this is like 95, 96, I think you recorded 90, 98, I think. Yeah. Okay. So I, um, I know it was a, you know, it was a post, uh, Brittany Fox type thing that, uh, you did with, uh, was it with, uh, um, the bass player and, and no, Brittany. with the drummer, with Johnny. Yeah. Yeah. Johnny. D. Um, right. So well, you, here's what happened. Check it out. We were, we were going to, this was 97, 98. We got together again, Brittany Fox and we were, we went back East and, and we were going to, uh, we went back East. I went back East. They already there. Um, and we rehearsed a uh -huh. bunch of originals, right? Because we wanted to maybe make a new record. And we did. And I brought some of those Uncle Edna tunes there then. And we yeah. actually played those with Britney Fox, all the, the band, you know. Wow. Uh, the song Freeze on there, mm -hmm. uh, we, Britney played in that those rehearsals. And nothing ever came of it. It just wasn't the right time, whatever. So I had a recording studio in Vegas. And I just asked Johnny if he wanted to come out. And he did. And I had this kick drum. I found this awesome rogers kick drum it was a 26 inch mm -hmm. it was almost like a marching bass drum it was huge right and so i built a kit around it i've got a 12 inch tom and 18 inch floor and blah 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 and this cool old chrome ludwig chrome snare right. for like 125 bucks it just kicked ass my friend i don't know if you heard of this awesome drummer jamie borden oh uh, yeah uh, he, he did, he did okay yeah he, he's jamie. a dear friend of mine yeah he he gave me that snare i think yeah. If I remember right, if I don't say that right, he'll he'll be pissed. Like, dude, I gave you that snare, man. What the hell? But no, it, it's it was a cheap snare, right? But it was it right. was uh, it was uh, chrome, and it was just ratty and sounded great. You know, it was, it was like had a great crack. Anyway, Johnny had even said, "Goes, dude, that's one of the coolest snare drums ever." And it's there's ones that are way more expensive, but this one was just great. But anyway, blah blah blah. So I built this wacky kit, and he came out. And we didn't have a lot of the dampening in the bass drum, right? So it was like this. It sounded like, you know, the Zeppelin sound in that big stairway. It was like, bra. You know, if you hit the kick drum, normally it's damp. It's like, right. this one was like, brah. Like he used to call it the oil rig. He goes, Jesus, get over. So we left it like that on the recording just to just to be stupid, I guess. But uh, it, fit the, it fit what we were doing. But anyway, so that was a fun project. We just never, it never went past that. There's, so, there's been a lot of sort of fits and starts with Brittany Fox uh, reunion <laughs> that have happened that I've oh, seen. Oh, I didn't go into that. Yeah. I didn't go into that. So later, spring hit comes out, right? right. Everyone's gone. See you. Goodbye. A few right. years later, we went back out. <laughs> there's so, there's just so, 2007, we went out. We had different guys. And uh, we had we had Greg D'Angelo yeah. was going to play drums from, uh, from White Lion. Right. And the two weeks before or a week before he said he said he broke his leg oh, no. or broke his foot or something so we were we were in a lurch and we got another drummer and we went out and we did a few months with that that we had some stuff there and then we off again and then in 2000 i think it was 2014 or 15 johnny and billy and me and different guitar player went out and did a, about two years of stuff mm -hmm. And then the 2016 was the Monsters of Rock Cruise. That was the last one that I did with them. So anyway, we, we've, we've done a few things in between. But truth is, it's like, it's such a stamp in time, that band and those songs and that sound to keep it, to keep it going. It's, uh, it's, you're damn near, you're damn near right up next to starting something brand new as yeah. far as what, what, what can be supported. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah if it was I'm, I'm not i'm not quite uh i don't quite have the marquee value say that mick jagger does so as far as getting something booked and everything it's like if the name doesn't bring some kind of marquee value that you can rely on to to put it out and and go mm -hmm. it just it's there's what's the point might as well start something brand new you know what i mean like right right because yeah. it's not much difference it breaks my heart a little bit to hear that, but I'd always kind of been curious why it had had those fits and starts and never really uh, taken on anything or there hadn't been any future albums from it. Because whenever I would read you guys were back or playing shows and things, I would get excited about it. But yeah, I, I, I can understand the the issue with that. If it's going to be um, hard to get it started, like you said, you're almost starting out fresh, even though you've got the name Brittany Fox, which certainly meant something back in the day still means something to uh, us diehard fans that grew up with it. 
but getting it booked, getting it out there, getting a tour of enough dates in a row and things like that, that so that you can, you know, earn a living from it. This is your job, you know, maybe your passion as well, but you're still earning a living from this. So, yeah, I, I understand that. But like I said, it breaks my heart a little bit to to know that that uh, it doesn't bring in what you need it to bring in to, to continue it. Well, I still I still uh, um, doing my solo band. I got great guys when the time's right. We've just been through a hellacious economy, so mm -hmm. probably don't need to go into that much. You probably uh, you all know have heard that. of <laughs> you all know about that, <laughs> like young Frankenstein. Right. Yes, yes, we all know what he did. No, um, so yeah, the economy and everything, but like, uh, we st I'll still play like Six Guns mm -hmm. and Louder and some and Liar and some some stuff off uh, Bite Down Hard still with my solo band. Yeah. So and and probably will always do some of those tunes. Uh, it just won't be steady diet of just Britney Fox stuff. That's that's a different stuff. So, but you know. Well, um, you're still keeping it alive and playing it at least in the the solo shows. I was going to ask if any of it was in the Count Seventy Seven stuff, or is that strictly uh, the Count Seventy Seven music? Yeah, no, that's all Count Seventy Seven stuff. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, it's it had some really good. We've recorded a ton of stuff. We recorded a, a second album mm -hmm. and a, and some singles and some live shows that just aren't released with Count Seventy Seven and. Uh, full pro shot yep. video and audio and the mobile unit and all that stuff and just kind of like things have to follow certain timing to to put it out you know what i mean so but we recorded a few probably four or five covers out in vegas at, at desert moon and um so we're still we're still doing that and we're doing live shows so yep. um so yeah it's Something for future. I mean, you're working on now, but something that will come out down the road. You're saying from all this this stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a ton of new material. We just it's it's been so busy. Mm -hmm. Everything's been so crazy busy and so wacky for the past few years. Um, you know, COVID changed everybody's livelihood. But for for us, I mean, it just stopped us dead. Right. I mean, there was you know what happened. So our livelihood was gone literally so yeah. for a while till it sorry i remember when it was first coming back i don't know how long a year or two years uh it would be like uh and you knew it was you knew it was just uh you knew it was some kind of politics or something going on because we were starting to come back get more gigs right i don't even remember how far into it but we'd be booked at like this casino on this night and say uh, um and the following night would be uh, like a, a Jeff Foxworthy or whatever. And then a casino, say, an hour and a half away would be having shows that same weekend. Mm -hmm. And we'd be all booked. And then our our weekend, uh, both nights, they would cancel like that Monday for that week. So yeah. it was just, all, you know, it was a lot of odd stuff that made no sense mm -hmm. going on when it was coming back. Because some people were like, oh, no, no, we got to keep. And I, you know, I don't. I don't blame anybody in particular. I'm just saying like getting, getting the industries back. I'm sure we could talk for ever about that stuff, but uh, you know, yeah. well, in the, in the cost of touring and, and your expenses, as far as that's concerned has certainly skyrocketed and gone up. I mean, just like everything else, whether we're talking, you know, groceries for the average person or on my end as an architect, the, the cost of construction is through the roof. Jeez. It, it's yeah. things that, the pandemic just upended everything and you know where you're talking about uh you know trying to earn a livelihood from this and whether or not a name that you're going to play under brings in enough uh you know people to see it does that marquee value to draw in and that's a hard thing to balance there costs go up and yet at the same time are you getting the draw that you need to get and so i can't even imagine the kind of stuff you have to go through on it and here we are, what, four years out now from the pandemic and everything's still not 100 percent. Everything. Not even. Part, yeah, it's just partially. And it's sort of like, when are we going to get there? But you're right. We could we could talk, <laughs> probably do an entire episode just on stuff like that. Oh, boy. Yeah. So long and short of it is I'm grateful to be here with you. I'm thankful to be here with you. And 
that's good enough for this exact moment. That's right. And and certainly, and I and I thank you for being here. This has been a wonderful experience having you on. Before we, uh, you know, in this though, is there anything additional that you'd like to promote or talk about? I know we talked about your solo work and different projects you're in and Count 77, which you're currently out, out playing with. Is there anything else that we didn't touch on? Um, no, just go to uh, go to live shows. Yeah. So tell everybody to go to live shows, even if you don't know who it is and whatever, just go have a drink and hang out for a little while. Uh, and then check out, um, I have a, I have a bunch of new material and I haven't even gotten anyone caught up on earth ears, but it's probably going to be through playing live and selling it there at the venue. But um got I have a brand new songs all the time and talking to my guitar player about getting another record rolling coming up. So just check uh, TommyParis.com and, you can write me from there and whatever. And uh, that's it, man. Keep rocking and go to live shows. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and certainly as you've got more new things coming up, let me know. Let me promote it on the channel here for you guys and, and get the word out, whether it's new music or a live tour that you're headed out on. If you've got dates, I'm happy to help give you guys a little push here. I appreciate it, dude. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, everyone. I want to thank uh, Tommy Paris for joining us here, former lead singer with Brittany Fox, but out on the road with uh, Count 77. And of course, you heard the other various projects and things he's got. And you can head over to TommyParis.com and catch up on all that great stuff there. A lot of cool merch and other things. And his latest solo album, Earth Ears, is available there for you guys to purchase. Other stuff is out streaming. Tommy Paris Band, you can check that out. It is a fantastic, in my opinion, return to form sound on Brittany Fox. So those of you that are hardcore fans like me with Brittany Fox, Definitely go check that stuff out. All right. Until next time, I'll talk to you later. Have a good one, everyone. Be cool, Brendan. Cheers, brother. Be yeah. cool, everyone. <laughs>